Uh, give us your full name. Alejandro Montejano. And Alex, uh, what happened today, man? Just and, and try to try to, com to, to keep your composure so people can understand what you're saying. What happened? Well, she reports herself once every week as part of the deal. She's here as a political refugee, and she wanted to go report herself today, and they just arrested it there for deportation. And when they brought her in and arrested her, what did they ask her? What did they say to her? They said that she was going to be deported the next day, and she said that we're married, and she's here as a political refugee, and she, they said that it doesn't matter. Everything's done, and not, and not, it doesn't really matter. What are you going to do now? I got to go find her with our kids so I could go, so she won't be alone. As a political refugee, Alejandro's wife reported to immigration authorities once a week. It was routine and Mrs. Montejano felt safe until one day she was deported. Throughout much of the 20th century, Kern County has suffered from anti-immigrant tensions. We wanted to take a closer look at the lives being impacted by the shift in immigration policy. Geography plays some role. Less than two hours drive from Los Angeles over the tall Tehachapi Mountains, Kern County feels cut off from the rest of California. Oil and agriculture dominate the economy and Republicans have controlled the political scene. In many ways, Kern County can be called Texas West. Congress in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s began to see was that these guys were actually settling the West and doing us a favor. And as a result, it took the Homestead Act where we began to say, let's give these guys an opportunity. Let's provide them an opportunity to have the land that they're working. And so we created the Homestead Act. And just like that, we took a group of people who were once considered to be illegal and turned them into the yeoman farmers. So they, we turned them in into the individuals who would become the backbone of America's middle class, just like that, overnight. And these were people who were on the outskirts, who were, who were outside of, of um, mainstream America at the time. With an act of Congress, you turned a group of people who were once considered squatters and illegal, and you turned them into the backbone of American democracy. So if we fast forward to the 20th and 21st century, what we have today is we have a whole group of undocumented people who are considered illegal. The problem isn't with them, it's with the system. We have a broken system with, that, that says, you need to get in line because you're here illegally. The problem is, is that we don't have an actual line uh, because the system is broken. And, and you can talk to Im any immigration attorney and they'll tell you the wait is 5, 10, 15 years and it's not even worth it. And, and so, so what we're dealing with today is we're dealing with a situation that we've dealt with in the past, but we don't have the foresight, we don't have the backbone, and we definitely don't have the ingenuity to do what we did in the past when it came to dealing with people who were undocumented, illegal, or squatters, and, and that's unfortunate. According to immigration law expert Wynne Eaton, the actual wait for U.S. citizenship can be over 100 years depending on certain factors. In the United States, we've had uh, a, a very dark history when it comes to immigration law and policy. It goes back to the Free Whites Only Act in the 1790s, uh, to the Asian Exclusion Act of 1882 and, and coming forward. And then it seems like at different periods in our history, we've set different demographic groups in the crosshairs. And I think largely that's based on a certain innate xenophobia that's alive in every human creature. So now we're in our crosshairs of the United States uh, law and policymakers is Hispanic community and the Middle Eastern populations. And I'm very concerned about where we've been because it points us where we are now and where we're going in the future. And it's not a very promising picture. I generally am an optimist by nature, but this is an area of society that I'm deeply concerned about. Mary is an undocumented immigrant living and working in Kern County. 
Every day she lives in fear of deportation. ¿Cómo se siente usted cuando camina por las calles y está trabajando en este país? ¿Cuál es el sentimiento que tiene? Ahora es es tristeza, es miedo. Uh, no sabes qué hacer. No sabes en qué momento te van a regresar para tu país. En qué momento se acaba el cuento de Cenicienta, se puede decir, porque este es algo bello y te mandan a un país, um, tu país, claro, pero donde no hay oportunidades de nada. ¿Usted se vino para acá para ayudar a su familia? Sí, yo me vine para acá para, para ayudar a mi familia y porque vivíamos una situación bien difícil. Um, mis hijos fueron violados y amenazados y tuvimos que emigrar. What, what made you decide to come share your story tonight? Because I never thought it was going to happen to me and I want it to happen to everybody else. No one. And tell us about you. Where are you born? I'm born in Los Angeles and I worked in the fields and in Pueblo Loco right here. All day until night, and she works all night, and we pay we pay everything. We don't get in trouble. And she doesn't have a criminal record, nothing. Now, why is it so dangerous for her to go back to Mexico? Because death threats in the mafia. Because it's not really that safe over there. And now I have to risk myself and go over there. So you're gonna cross the border to Tijuana to go find her? I'm gonna go, yeah. I'm gonna go across the border. I don't need, this is my country and I have to leave to just to go find her. Alejandro shared his story at California State University, Bakersfield, at a legal clinic sponsored by the Center for Social Justice and the Immigration Justice Collaborative. More than 300 residents attended the event. Beto, um, this is the fourth event, correct? Yes. And where are we at tonight? <sighs> tonight, I think we are seeing now the reality of what we feared might happen. Uh, the uh, Department of Homeland Security issued uh, a memo for interior enforcement of the immigration laws, which provides a very, very broad um, range of discretion for ICE agents. It empowers ICE agents with much more, uh, much more ability to detain people for removal. And so it makes what we did tonight even that much more important. Because these are very daunting times and people need to be aware of what they should do and should not do to avoid contact with immigration. So we really, really need to get together a group of lawyers that are willing to serve on the panel. And I don't want to just do four lawyers or six lawyers. I want 12. What I think would be most effective would be to reach out to as many lawyers as we can so that we have a cadre of lawyers available. We thought of entitling this whole project the Immigration Justice Collaborative. What do, what do you think about that? The volunteer attorneys specialize in a number of different areas of law, including criminal defense, immigration, civil rights, and employment rights. 12 licensed attorneys all in front of you from Kern County, not from outside the county, but from Kern County, from varying disciplines of law. That's just gonna have a powerful, powerful visual. The IJC has played a valuable role in addressing the fears that permeate the immigrant community. Not only these lawyers are going to have different backgrounds and different practice areas and can share how the imminent changes we expect the president elect will affect them, uh, give people a sense of empowerment. 
The Immigration Justice Collaborative provides information on knowing your constitutional rights, especially unreasonable searches, immigration reform updates such as DACA and the DREAM Act, and also available legal resources. Criminal law, we want to list criminal law. My forte. That's it, you? Yeah, that's and, you. And uh, Torres. David Torres, Torres, one of the top criminal lawyers in Kern County. And so I think that what we're doing here is we're all volunteering our time to make sure that we get the word out and make sure that these folks who are scared, to give them a safety base and let them know that we're there to protect them. They're important for a couple of reasons. Number one is there's a tremendous amount of fear in the communities, particularly in the immigrant communities, about what could be coming with the new administration. And largely, I'd like to alleviate those fears. The purpose of the IJC is to educate and provide some measure of protection to the minority and immigrant communities that live and work in Kern County. It is a collaborative because it's not only the lawyers. We're going to rely on the community organizers, on all the contacts you have with Latina leaders, with the politicians, the Hispanic chamber. We're here to provide um, education and outreach to the rural areas in Kern County. Are you getting paid tonight? I am not. Why are you doing this for free? Why am I doing it for free? Because people need to know. This is, this is a, a subject that's very close to my heart and, and uh, our practice is centered. Uh, largely, I got involved with immigration law because of a passion to keep families together and to make sure the government is held accountable when they make mistakes and wrongheadedly try to uh, uh, rob employers of employees that they desperately need to run their operations and try to tear families apart unnecessarily. The outreach uh, that we're doing uh, to as many people as we can in a short period uh, of time before the uh, inauguration. Okay. I think it's critical. We shared Alejandro's stories with members of other historically ostracized groups in Kern County. We talked about the IJC, changes in Washington, and the community's long-standing struggle with racism. We asked each person to share their experiences with discrimination. That is what happened to the Sikh community after 9-11. And it was really unfortunate. You know, being born and raised here, I never thought that we would be facing this kind of racism or discrimination. Um, my mother had fireworks thrown at her door after 9-11. Um, a lot of the Sikh community was getting harassed and called names, and there were some attacks, getting beat up. Uh, there was a gentleman shot and killed in Arizona by somebody because they believed, you know, he was a terrorist. Um, so what was happening is the Sikh community all of a sudden was realizing, uh oh, we're the targets now. And I remember a lot of them would put American flags on their front door and stickers on their car to say, hey, like, we love America. We, we, are, we are not here to destroy this country. We've been here a long time. We're having to justify our Americanness. Um, and then I felt like things were getting a bit better. And then Trump happened. And now we have this man who's inciting fear and hatred, and it just started all over again and more intense because now you have this person who's saying it's okay to group us in this category of terrorists and, you know, and label minorities as terrorists. There was racial bias, and, and even at that time, it, it wasn't as subtle as it is now. The persons let you know exactly how they felt. First of all, they would look at you for color, and then they would size you up to see a, it, what kind of economic background you had. And actually, doing shopping out of that community area, you were treated differently, definitely. And first of all, by color alone, for, for me and my family. Racism has stopped in Bakersfield, or is it still present? <laughs> you dare ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> sure is present, and it's more subtle now because of the knowledge and the, the, the way bills and things are written, and 
If the community doesn't keep up with it, they do things that they don't even know they're going to jail for. They think it's okay. But no, it's, and it's worse now because once you get in that jail system, I, I had a feeling that very, very few people get out unless they die. The only residents, my understanding and education, was the Native Americans. Prior, that's it. Everyone else immigrated here. There are basically up to over 73 different immigrant, uh, it, different cultures, I call them cultures here. And they're beautiful cultures. And the number rose with the Indian culture coming in. It's not just the Sikhs, it's so many more beautiful ones. And if you attend their events, oh my gosh, they're gorgeous. The Greek festival, if you've never been, go. The Basque, there's the Spanish and the French. And they used to have their bass celebrations and I used to go with, go to them and oh, it was just awesome to see them gather for a whole weekend of fun. The Asian community has increased. You have a large group of Vietnamese that are here. The Koreans, uh, a large group of them. Um, they've opened markets, shopping centers here. Uh, they have businesses all over the place. The Japanese culture has been here as long as the Chinese. Um, some of the schools are named after some of those founding families. Uh, Sing Lam and Ming Avenue is named after Mary Ming's family, the Ming family. If you look at uh, uh, the history of Kern County, um, you know, John Steinbeck uh, wrote about it. Uh, he famously wrote about it in The Grapes of Wrath and, and he wrote about the Yokies. And, and people tend to forget locally that, uh, that the, the people from Arkansas and Oklahoma were not initially welcomed uh, here in Kern County. It's one of the reasons why uh, we have some of these communities outside of Bakersfield like Oildale because they were literally forced out. And these were people looking for opportunities as well. They were not welcome. My sisters, I said, our dad might have been an illegal migrant because the vagrancy laws of 1937 when my dad came uh, was he, my dad was supposed to have visible means of support and he was supposed to have I think $25 in his possession. Well I know my dad didn't have $25 in his possession because they ran out of money in Roll, Arizona and had to keep, clean out a slough with rattlesnakes in it to make enough gas money to uh, come to California. My dad said every night he quit and every morning he went back to work. In 1937 California passed an anti oki law, making it a misdemeanor to bring or assist in bringing any indigent person into the state. The law was later declared unconstitutional, but the bias remained. And, and as a result, if you look at Kern County, we have this history, people here in Kern County want to readily embrace, but unfortunately it's there. And then we can go from the 1930s, we can go from the depression, jump forward into the 1960s, 1970s with Cesar Chavez, and you have the same situation. Now let's jump forward again another 40 years, and here we are today, and we're dealing with somebody like the sheriff, uh, Donnie Youngblood, who, who wants to create this non-sanctuary county environment. In 2007, two resolutions were presented by a Bakersfield city councilman declaring English as Bakersfield official language and Bakersfield as a non-sanctuary city for undocumented immigrants. Both resolutions failed. And uh, I'm very adamant that we are not a sanctuary county and I think it's, it, that uh, I need to say that. Uh, Sheriff, what will, is it your contention that if uh, this county does not declare itself a non-sanctuary county, that the administration is going to withhold the $4 million. Have you been told that? Do we have evidence of that? Why should we believe that? Sheriffs are placed right in the middle of that, and the crosshairs of that, between the federal and state government. All we want to do is do our job, keep our public safe, and allow the federal government to do their job, which is immigration. I can't promise you what the federal government may or may not do. I, I, I have no idea. What I do know is that uh, I'm taking a stand for where we are in this county. This is who we are uh, as, a, as a county and who we should be as a country, quite frankly.
We uncovered footage dating back to 1966 of U.S. Senator Robert F. Kennedy leading hearings of the Senate Subcommittee on Migratory Labor. In the footage, Kennedy questions Kern County Sheriff Leroy Galen on his department's response to the Delano Grape Strike. If I have reason to believe that there's going to be a riot started and somebody tells me that there's going to be trouble if they don't stop them, then it's my duty to stop them. And then you go out and arrest them? Well, absolutely. And charge them? Charge them. What do you charge them with? Uh, to violate an uh, unlawful assembly. Well, I think that that's the most interesting. Who told you that they're going to riot? I, the men right out in the field that they were talking to said, if you don't get them out of here, well, we're going to cut their hearts out. So, so rather than let them get cut, you remove the cause. How can you go arrest somebody if they haven't violated the law? They're ready to violate the law. In other words... Could I suggest in the interim period of time, in the luncheon period of time, that the sheriff and the district attorney read the Constitution of the United States? We invited Sheriff Youngblood to explain his stance on the non-sanctuary county resolution. What my point was is that if you're in the country illegally and you're committing crimes, I believe that, that you should be deported. I believe that we should have the opportunity to, to interact with those partners and I believe that we shouldn't have a sanctuary for those people because I'm here to protect the victims. It seems that the immigrant, undocumented immigrant community gets blamed for a lot. Well, certainly there, that exists. I mean, I can tell you without even looking at statistics that uh, the uh, undocumented uh, community in Kern County is not a law enforcement problem for us by any large degree. At least, I can honestly say, no more than any other segment of society. While Sheriff Youngblood clarified his views on the undocumented community, other law enforcement agencies have a more proactive approach. Our policy, our philosophy is that regardless of an individual's immigration status, we want them and it is necessary that they feel safe and comfortable about reporting crime, certainly being a victim of crime or being a witness to crime. Um, we cannot fulfill our responsibilities as a police department to this community if there are segments of our community that don't report um, don't tell us what they witness uh, out of fear. Uh, and so we um, try very hard to ensure that that level of, and communicate that that level of fear is not necessary, that you being a victim or a witness to a crime will not automatically lead to an immigration inquiry or deportation. Now, I don't think that anybody uh, in our immigrant community uh, wants to see uh, dangerous uh, people, of course, in our communities of, of any type, be they citizen, immigrant, or undocumented. But declaring, as uh, Sheriff Youngblood has wanted to do, a law in Order County uh, really sends a very, very strong message and, and really strikes a lot of fear in the immigrant community. And contrary to uh, what Sheriff Youngblood said, uh, there is a lot of fear in the immigrant community and people will not come forward and they will not, uh, and I can tell you many, many instances where crimes have been committed, but they are afraid uh, to call the sheriffs or the police uh, because of fear of deportation. You know, one of the things that we have to remember is that the immigrants in our community really hold up the economy. Uh, in agriculture, in the oil fields, in the hospitality industry, in the service industry, and uh, we know that their contributions are, are huge. Bueno, yo no iba preparada ni pensaba hablar. Solamente sabía que iba a estar ahí el sheriff del condado de Kern. Él estaba pidiendo que se propusiera al condado como no santuario. Cuando le escuché hablar sobre las personas indocumentadas o los inmigrantes, cómo quería expulsarlos, eso me enojó mucho. Y yo le quise decir que pues no somos las personas que él cree, que somos personas útiles. Uh, las personas que trabajan en el campo sin documentos son una base muy fuerte para la economía de la agricultura y otras cosas. Uh, quisiera preguntarle si alguna vez él ha visto en su comunidad. Uh, I want to ask him if he ever seen uh, in his community. Que hay grupos de personas no docu sin documentos y voluntarias. If uh, there are 
uh, group of people without documents but are volunteering uh, for their community. Trabajando por más de 10 años en mejorar nuestros parques y nuestra comunidad. Working for more than 10 years improving our parks and our community. Gracias por escucharme. Thank you for listening to me. The Greenfield Walking Group receives funding from the California Endowment's Building Healthy Communities South Kern Initiative to support a daily Zumba class in Southeast Bakersfield. What the California Endowment is doing with uh, Building Healthy Communities, uh, I, I think they're investing in the most important asset and the most important resource in the communities that they're in, and that is the residents, the people that live in these communities, to find out those individuals that are being impacted the most uh, or negatively impacted the most by the environment, whether again it's violence, lack of resources, access to food, access to health care, uh, low income, poverty, um, and even being undocumented, the California Endowment's investment is to build these people up as leaders so that they can advocate for their needs. And then other agencies, agencies like ourselves, come um, and, and walk this journey with them and support them in the process to make sure that uh, the gaps are filled. And we know that these individuals that are migrating into this community uh, are, are the hard workers. They're the ones that are doing the hard work in agriculture. They're the ones that are, are setting, uh, preparing the food for our tables, right? Uh, and even in the service sector, we see a lot of these individuals working there. So they are contrib contributing to our local economy. It is estimated that legalizing undocumented residents would lead to an additional $8.6 in revenue by increasing undocumented immigrants' effective tax rate thereby increasing their state and local tax contributions. They are paying their taxes, they're paying their dues, um, and they're raising healthy families. They're, they're raising families with uh, good morals and good hardworking values. I believe we invited the immigration and we did not enforce immigration law. So I cannot be really harsh or draconian in my, uh, in my belief about deportations. Uh, I don't believe in deporting who's here that we brought. Uh, although I do believe there should be um, an immigration plan, I believe that, that we should decide who can come and who can't come. But I do not blame the uh, Mexican immigrant for coming here for a better life. That's why my dad came. On May 2nd, the IJC attended the Board of Supervisors meeting to protest Sheriff Youngblood's presentation. The IJC continues to advocate on behalf of undocumented residents. One of the objectives of the collaborative is to bring some sense uh, and some reason and some rationality to what we just saw here today. As lawyers, we will be able to tell the people that uh, the sheriff has to comply with what the law requires. He has to comply with the Constitution. And uh, it makes the job of the collaborative now that much more important as we go forward today uh, so that we can inform the people really what the law requires and not what one man's rhetoric is. The foundation, the roots of the IJC is in familia. It is a human story because that's where it all begins. What we're trying to do is we're trying to keep families together. We're trying to make sure that everybody can grow together. And that's the entire purpose. The purpose behind these laws was to break up families. That's why we have the roots here in terms of trying to keep us all together to make sure that uh, we don't grow up separately and that they win in the end. On October 5th, 2017, Governor Jerry Brown signed Senate Bill 54, making California a sanctuary state. The struggle continues. Moving forward, what's the future of the IJC? Where, where do you guys want to go with it? The, the IJC is still very much active and intact. We're available to uh, any uh, community groups uh, if they wish us to address um, some of the policies. Uh, executive orders have been rolled out by the administration. We're prepared to do that. Uh, we're uh, at uh, their disposal. So uh, in that regard, it is still and remains a very viable component of this community. Uh, we are also available as we uh, did be, uh, an appearing before the Board of Supervisors to uh, extend a legal position regarding any policies or uh, executive orders um, or legislation that uh, may 
be pushed through by the administration. So what do you recommend to people that are watching uh, tonight and who, who are here tonight? What do you tell them? We gotta be together, together, to help each other, and to show them that we can do it, that this, this whole country is one, to not fall apart in these times. Alex, we thank you for your bravery, man. Thank you so much, brother, okay? We're here to help you, man. Yes, I go to the market in Arvin, I think it used to be called the Ranch Market, I'm not sure what it is now, I go in there all the time, um, is that when I see now a young Mexican father with his family, his wife and his uh, three or four kids, which wouldn't have been as many as our seven, that five survived, and he has brown from here down and he has this white up above because he doesn't have his hat on. Uh, when I see that, I, I get pretty emotional about it. When I see that, I see my father, I see my mother in 1937. And uh, up through my brother was born in 45. I see my father and I see me.